Chapter 5. What is True Knowledge? What is true knowledge? Can any knowledge that we now have be called true knowledge? Or is all our knowledge just a semblance of true knowledge? Is there indeed any such thing as true knowledge? And if so, how can we know what it is? Is it something that we can attain, or is it beyond the power of the human mind to grasp? If it is beyond the power of our mind to grasp, do we have any deeper level of consciousness by which we can experience it? How can we experience true knowledge? Let us first decide what knowledge can be considered as true. To qualify as being true knowledge in the strictest sense of the term, the knowledge in question must be absolutely true, perfectly, permanently, unconditionally, and independently true. That is, it must be a knowledge that is true in its own right, a knowledge that is true at all times, in all states, and under all conditions, a knowledge whose truth is not in any way depended upon, limited by, or relative to any other thing, a knowledge whose truth is ever unchanging and immutable, being unaffected by anything else that may appear or disappear, or by any changes that may occur around it. It must also be self-evident, perfectly clear and absolutely reliable, devoid of even the least ambiguity or uncertainty. It must be known directly, not through any intervening media upon whose truth and reliability its own truth and reliability would then depend. Only such knowledge can be considered to be true knowledge in an absolute sense. Knowledge that is not true from such an absolute standpoint, but only from a relative standpoint, is not perfectly true. It may be true under some conditions, but it is not true under all conditions. It may be true at one time, or in one state, but it is not true at all times, or in all states. It is true only relative to certain other things, and hence, its truth is dependent upon and limited by the truth of those other things, and is affected by their appearance and disappearance, and by changes that may take place within them. Such relative knowledge is uncertain and unreliable, particularly since it is invariably obtained by us, not directly, but only through the intervening media of our mind and our five senses, whose truth and reliability are, as we shall see later, open to serious doubt. Knowledge which is thus true only relatively, and not absolutely, does not warrant the name true knowledge, and a strict analysis of what knowledge can be considered as true or real. Therefore, whenever the term true knowledge is used in this book, it means only knowledge that is absolutely true, and not just relatively true. The aim of this book is not to deny the relative truth or validity of any of the many forms of relative knowledge that we experience but is to investigate our experience deeply in order to discover whether or not any knowledge within our experience is absolutely true. If we can discover some knowledge that is absolute from the perspective of that absolute knowledge, we will be able to appreciate better the relativity of all the relative forms of knowledge that we now experience because we think that we do not now experience anything that is absolute, we attribute undue reality and give undue credence to the seeming truth of all our relative knowledge. This book, therefore, is primarily concerned not with determining the relative truth of any knowledge, but only with investigating whether there is any absolutely true knowledge that we can experience. Most of the knowledge that we now take to be true is only relatively true. For example, we generally accept that with the exception of 
optical illusions such as a mirage and other such sensory misperceptions, the knowledge that we acquire by means of our five senses is true. However, all such knowledge is relative because it is dependent upon the questionable reliability of our five senses and because it is limited to their range of perception. Since our physical senses are strictly limited and not entirely reliable, they are an imperfect media for acquiring true knowledge. Though they may provide us with knowledge that is relatively true and that meets many of our relative needs, including our biological survival, they cannot provide us with any knowledge that is absolutely true. Not only is all the knowledge that we acquire by means of our five senses merely relative, but so also is all the knowledge that we acquire by means of our mind. Like our five physical senses, our mind is an imperfect medium for acquiring true knowledge because it is a limited and unreliable instrument. We all recognize the fact that much of the knowledge that our mind takes to be true at certain times is not actually true. For example, our mind may mistake an illusion to be true while it is experiencing it, but it later recognizes that it was at that time mistaken in its judgment of what is true or real. Likewise, our mind mistakes its experiences in a dream to be true while it is actually experiencing that dream but it later recognizes that all those experiences were imaginary and therefore not true. Since we know that our mind is easily deceived into believing that whatever it is currently experiencing is true, how can we rely upon our mind as a dependable instrument through which we can acquire true knowledge? Our mind is not just deluded temporarily into mistaking its own imaginations to be true, but is also deluded repeatedly into making this same mistake. Having once understood that in dream it was deluded into mistaking the unreal to be real, it does not thereby become immune from being again deluded in the same manner. The same delusion repeats itself again and again whenever our mind experiences a dream. Since it is unable to learn from its repeated mistakes, our mind is a very unreliable judge of what knowledge is true and what knowledge is false. When it is so frequently incapable of recognizing its own imaginations as false, how can we be sure that anything that it experiences is not merely an illusion, an unreal product of its own imagination? Our mind has access to only two basic sources of objective knowledge, namely its five physical senses which it believes provide it with knowledge obtained from outside itself and its own internal generated knowledge such as its thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, concepts, and so on. Neither of these two sources can provide it with consistently reliable information. Its physical senses often provide it with misperceptions, and its internally generated knowledge often provides it with dreams. And when it actually experiences such misperceptions or dreams, it is usually unable to distinguish them from all its other knowledge, which it assumes to be true. Moreover, our mind is unable to distinguish between the knowledge that is supposed to have obtained from each of these two sources. In a dream, our mind believes that the world it is experiencing is perceived by it through its physical senses and that the world therefore exists outside itself. However, when it wakes up from that dream, our mind recognizes that the world in its dream was not actually perceived by it through any physical senses, but was only an internally generated imagination. Even now, in our present waking state, 
Our mind has no means of knowing for certain that the knowledge that it seems to obtain from outside itself through its physical senses is not actually just an internally generated imagination. All the knowledge that our mind experiences is experienced by it within itself. So it has no reliable means of knowing for certain that any of its knowledge is actually derived from outside itself. Whether we imagine it to be derived from some external source or to be internally generated or a combination of both, any knowledge we have of anything other than ourself is objective knowledge. All objective knowledge is dualistic and therefore relative because it involves a distinction between the knowing subject and the known objects. Any knowledge that involves any form of duality must necessarily be relative. Since the knowledge we have of everything else is objective, dualistic, and therefore relative, the only knowledge we have that can possibly qualify as absolute is our subjective and therefore non-dual knowledge of ourself. Our knowledge of ourself, that is, of our own essential being, is the only knowledge that is devoid of all duality and relativity. To know ourself, that is, to experience our own essential being as I am, we do not need the aid of our five senses or even of our mind. We know our own being, I am, even in sleep, when we are completely unaware either of our body and its five senses or of our mind. Therefore, our basic knowledge I am is not dependent upon any other thing. In the complete absence of all otherness, such as in sleep, we know I am. Whatever else we may know, and even when we know nothing else, we always know I am. Therefore, a basic knowledge I am is not only completely independent of all other knowledge, it is also permanent and unchanging. Other forms of knowledge may come and go, and they may even appear to be superimposed temporarily upon our basic knowledge I am, thereby seemingly obscuring it, though never actually hiding it. But this knowledge I am itself remains permanently, without ever coming or going, appearing or disappearing, or beginning or ending, and without ever undergoing any change. Therefore, this basic knowledge of our own being I am, is the only absolute knowledge we experience. The reason why we always know ourselves as I am is that we are consciousness, and consciousness is necessarily and essentially self-conscious. As consciousness, we always know our own being, not because our being is an object known by us, but because it is ourself, our own essential consciousness. We are therefore both being and consciousness. Our being and our consciousness are a single non-dual whole. Our consciousness is being because it is, and our being is consciousness because it knows itself. However, when we say this, we are expressing the oneness of our being and our consciousness crudely and imperfectly, because we are speaking about them in the third person as if they were objects. Our being consciousness does not know itself objectively as a third person, but only subjectively as the first person. Therefore, rather than saying that our consciousness is being because it is, we can express the truth more accurately by saying that we are being because we are. Likewise, rather than saying that our being is consciousness because it knows itself, we can express the truth more accurately by saying that we are consciousness because we know ourself. Still more accurately, we can express the truth by saying that I am being because I am. And I am consciousness because I know myself, because not only does our being consciousness know itself, only subjectively as the first person, but it also knows itself not as the first person, plural, but only 
as the perfectly non-dual first-person singular. In his teachings, whether he happened to be referring to our real self or to our individual self, Sri Ramana often used the first-person plural noun we rather than the first-person singular noun I. But he did not mean to imply thereby that there is any sense of plurality or duality in our real self. He referred to our real self as we in order to include whomever he was speaking to or writing for and to indicate that we are all one reality. In many cases, if he had used I instead of we, it would have created the impression that our real self is exclusive, whereas in truth it is all-inclusive. Therefore, wherever he has used the term we in reference to our real self, we should understand that he used it as the first-person inclusive pronoun rather than as the first-person plural pronoun. All our objective knowledge is known by us indirectly through the imperfect media of our mind and five senses, whereas consciousness is known by us directly as our own self. No form of indirect or immediate knowledge can be absolute, because such knowledge is inherently partitioned and dualistic, and since it involves a distinction between the subject that is knowing, the object that is known, and the medium through which the subject knows the object, since absolute knowledge must be free of all limitations, both internal and external, it must be devoid of any divisions parts, or duality. It must therefore be direct and immediate knowledge, knowledge that knows itself in itself and by itself, without the aid of any internal or external medium. Absolute knowledge must therefore be self-conscious, perfectly and singly self-conscious. It must be known by itself and only by itself. It cannot be known by anything other than itself, because if it were, it would not be absolute. The existence of anything other than it that could know it would set a limitation upon the wholeness of its being, and would therefore mean that it was not absolute in the fullest sense of the word. Absolute knowledge cannot exist in relation to anything else, but only in itself and by itself. In order to be absolute, a knowledge must be the only truly existing knowledge. All knowledge that appears to be other than it must be false. Conversely, to be true, absolutely and perfectly true, a knowledge must be absolute. Since true knowledge must therefore, by definition, be absolute, it must be a single, infinite, whole, undivided, non-dual, immediate, and self-conscious knowledge. The only knowledge that knows itself is our essential consciousness of our own being I am. Even our mind is not truly self-conscious, because it does not know itself as it really is, and because its seeming self-consciousness is limited to the two imaginary states of waking and dream. The only knowledge that is truly self-conscious, therefore, is our fundamental consciousness I am because it knows itself always undisturbed and unaffected by the passing of the three transient states of waking dream and sleep. Our essential consciousness I am is not only immediately and eternally self-conscious, it is also single, undivided, and non-dual. Is it, however, infinite? Is it the unlimited whole other than which nothing can exist? Yes, it is, because it has no form of its own, and hence it is free of all boundaries and limits. Therefore, since it is not limited in any way, nothing can truly be other than it. Everything else that appears to exist depends for its seeming existence upon our basic consciousness I am. No other knowledge could exist if our first and original knowledge I am did not exist. Since all other knowledge appears and disappears in our mind, and since our mind appears and disappears in our underlying consciousness I am, no knowledge is truly separate from or other than this fundamental consciousness I am.
The otherness of all other knowledge, our feeling that what we know is separate from or other than ourself, is caused by the limitations that we seemingly impose upon ourself when we imagine ourselves to be a finite creature, a consciousness that experiences itself as I am this body. However, even when we experience this illusion of separation or otherness, all our other knowledge is known in us and by us. However, even when we experience this illusion of separation or otherness, all our other knowledge is known in us and by us, so it is truly not separate from or other than ourself. It is, in fact, all just a product of our imagination. And our imagination is just a distorted function of our consciousness. The apparent being of every other thing that we know is just a projection of our own true being, which is consciousness. Though other things appear to exist outside ourselves, the outside in which they occur is actually just a part of our imagination. The process by which they are projected from within ourself into a seeming outside is, in fact, just an internal distortion of our consciousness. A distortion that nevertheless occurs not really, but only seemingly. None of the things that we know have any being or existence apart from our knowledge of them. And hence, in the final analysis, all things are only knowledge. And knowledge is only consciousness. In a dream, we experience knowledge of things that appear to be separate from and other than ourselves. But when we wake up, we recognize that all such knowledge was created by our imagination and therefore had no independent existence outside our consciousness. Like any other form of imagination, a dream is just an internal distortion of our natural consciousness. All the knowledge that we experience in our dream is formed in our own consciousness and of our own consciousness. That is, the substance of which all our imaginations are formed is our own consciousness. Other than our consciousness, there is no substance from which all our imaginations, our thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and every form of dualistic knowledge could be formed. The only substance we truly know is our own consciousness or being. Everything else that we seem to know is generated by our consciousness within itself and from its own substance. However, there is an important distinction between our consciousness that seems to imagine and experience other forms of knowledge and our real consciousness, which experiences only our own being I am. Our consciousness that imagines that it is experiencing otherness, knowledge of things other than itself, is what we call our mind. Though this mind is in essence just our real and infinite consciousness of being I am, it experiences itself as a finite consciousness because it imagines the appearance of things other than itself. Its separation or distinction from our real consciousness is therefore just an imagination. Nevertheless, when we are critically analyzing our various forms of knowledge or consciousness, and testing the reality. This distinction between our object-knowing consciousness and our self-knowing consciousness is one that we have to make in order to be able to experience the latter as it really is. Because this distinction is the root cause of all duality, it is, in effect, very real and significant. So long as we experience even the slightest trace of any duality or otherness, since our aim is to experience our true and essential knowledge or consciousness as it really is. A need inevitably arises for us to distinguish it from all the unreal forms of knowledge that we have seemingly superimposed upon it by our power of imagination. Since all other forms of knowledge are experienced in and by our mind, in order to distinguish our true knowledge I am from every other knowledge, we need only distinguish it from our mind. Our mind is just a distorted form of our true consciousness of being I am. And it has become distorted only by imagining things other than itself. <laughs>
since knowing itself just as I am is the very nature of consciousness, the natural target or resting place of its attention is itself. That is, in its true and natural state, the focus or attention of our consciousness rests automatically and effortlessly upon itself and not upon any other thing. Our attention becomes diverted away from ourselves towards other things only when we imagine them or form them in our consciousness. So long as the focus of our consciousness or attention rests naturally upon ourself, we remain as the infinite real consciousness or true knowledge that we always are. But when the focus of our consciousness seems to be diverted towards imaginary objects or thoughts, we seem to become the finite consciousness that we call our mind. Therefore, if our mind wishes to experience the true knowledge that is its own real self, all it need do is withdraw its attention from all other things and to focus it keenly upon its own essential consciousness I am. This state in which our mind thus rests its attention in itself, knowing only its own being or consciousness, is described by Sri Ramana in verse 16 of Upadesa Undiyar as the state of true knowledge. Our mind, knowing its own form of light, having given up knowing external objects, alone is true knowledge. When our mind knows external objects or things other than itself, it does so by mistaking itself to be a physical body, which is one among those other things that it knows. But when it withdraws its attention back towards itself, it will cease to know any other thing, and thereby it will cease to make itself to be a physical body or any other product of its imagination. By thus attending only to its own essential consciousness or form of light, and thereby giving up attending to any form of imagination, our mind will experience itself as its own natural consciousness of being I am. In other words, by tending to and knowing only its own true consciousness of being, our mind will merge and become one with that consciousness. This non-dual experience of true self-consciousness is the state of true and absolute knowledge. What exactly does Sri Ramana mean when he speaks of our mind knowing its own form of light, having relinquished external objects? What is our mind's? own form of light. Our mind, as we saw in chapter 3, is our compound consciousness, I am this body, which is composed of two elements, our essential and fundamental consciousness, I am, and the superimposed adjunct, this body. Since the adjunct, this body, appears at one time and disappears at another time, and since it changes form, appearing as one body in waking, and another body in dream, it is merely a superficial appearance, a spurious and unreal apparition. Therefore, the only real element of our mind is our fundamental consciousness I am, our essential consciousness of our own existence, because this fundamental and essential consciousness is permanent, not something that appears at one time and disappears at another time and never changes its form. Since this fundamental consciousness of our own being is thus the true and essential form of our mind, and since it is the light that enables our mind to know not only itself, but also all other things, in this verse Sri Ramana refers to it as our mind's own form of light. When our mind turns its power of attention back on itself, away from all other things, focusing its attention keenly and exclusively upon its fundamental and essential consciousness of its own being, I am. It will subside and disappear, merging in and becoming one with that fundamental consciousness. That is, when we who now mistake ourselves to be this limited individual consciousness that we call mind, Focus our attention exclusively upon our fundamental adjunct-free consciousness I am. We will discover this adjunct-free consciousness to be our own real self. And thus we will no longer mistake ourselves to be this mind, the adjunct-bound consciousness 
I am this body. However, so long as we attend to things other than ourself, we will perpetuate the illusion that we are this mind. In order to know ourself as we really are, therefore, we must stop attending to other things and must attend only to our own essential being, our adjunct-free consciousness, I am. Therefore, when our mind gives up its habit of attending to external objects and instead knows only its own true form of light, our clear self-luminous consciousness, I am, it will no longer appear to be a separate entity called mind, but will instead shine only as its own true and essential being, which is our eternally self-knowing consciousness, I am. Hence, that which knows our adjunct free consciousness, I am, is not actually our mind, but is only our adjunct free consciousness itself, since it knows only itself, and is known only by itself. Our adjunct free consciousness, I am, is essentially non-dual. Therefore, our mind knowing its own form of light, having relinquished external objects, is the non-dual state in which by knowing its own true and essential nature, our mind has ceased to be the imaginary adjunct-bound object-knowing consciousness called mind, and instead remains only as our essential adjunct-free self-consciousness, our true consciousness, which always knows only its own being, I am. As Sri Ramana says, this non-dual state of clear self-consciousness or self-knowledge is alone the state of true knowledge. Why is this so? The only thing we know with absolute certainty is I am. If we ourselves did not exist, we could not know any other thing. Therefore, because we are conscious, we do exist. We may not know exactly what we are, but we cannot reasonably have any doubt about the fact that we are. Our consciousness I am is therefore the only knowledge that we can be absolutely sure is true knowledge. Unlike all other knowledge, which is only relatively or conditionally true, our consciousness I am is absolutely and unconditionally true because it is permanent, unchanging and perfectly self-evident. Since it is known directly by itself and not by anything else or through any other medium, its truth or reality does not depend upon any other thing. Because it is true at all times, in all states, and under all conditions, and because it is ever unchanging and immutable, being unaffected by anything else that may appear or disappear, or by any changes that may occur around it, it is true in its own right. Absolutely, unconditionally, and independently true. Since it is the only thing we experience at all times, in all states, and under all conditions, and since it always remains as it is without ever undergoing any change, this fundamental consciousness I am must be our real self, our true and most essential nature. However, Though we already know this consciousness I am, we do not clearly know it as it is, because it seems to be clouded by the superimposition of our mind, the spurious consciousness that always knows itself mixed with adjuncts, and that can never know itself free of adjuncts as the mere consciousness I am. Therefore, rather than being the means to true knowledge, our mind is in fact the primary obstacle to true knowledge. Why can no knowledge other than self-knowledge, the non-dual state in which we clearly know and firmly abide as the consciousness that knows only its own being, I am, be considered to be true knowledge? All knowledge other than a real adjunct-free non-dual consciousness, I am, is known only by our mind. Our faults adjunct-bound consciousness, I am this body. Whereas our unadulterated consciousness I am is essentially non-dual because it knows only its own being, our mind is an intrinsically dual form of consciousness because it appears as a separate individual consciousness only by seemingly knowing things other than itself.
all dual knowledge, that is, all knowledge in which what is known is separate from or other than that which knows it, is relative knowledge. That which is known as an object distinct from the knowing subject exists relative to that subject which knows it, and is therefore dependent for its seeming reality upon that subject. Unless the knowing subject is itself real, none of its knowledge of objects can be real. All the knowledge that we have of objects is only thoughts that our mind has formed within itself by its power of imagination. We cannot know any objects, anything other than our own being I am, except through the medium of our mind. Hence, we cannot know whether any object really exists, independent of the thought of it that we have formed in our mind. Therefore, all our knowledge about everything other than I am is nothing but thoughts, which are only as real as our mind that has formed them. As we have seen earlier, our mind, together with all its knowledge of duality, is merely an imagination superimposed upon the one real knowledge, which is our non-dual consciousness I am. Our consciousness I am is non-dual because it knows only itself, its own essential being, and not any other thing. That which knows things that are seemingly other than itself is only our mind. All objective knowledge, all knowledge of duality, all knowledge other than I am, is known only by our mind, and therefore exists only relative to our mind. Hence, all knowledge other than I am is dualistic and relative knowledge, and as such depends for its seeming reality upon our mind that knows it. Our mind is an unreal form of consciousness because it comes into existence as a separate object-knowing consciousness only by falsely identifying itself, its essential consciousness I am, with an adjunct, this body, which is merely one of its own thoughts, an image that it has formed within itself by its power of imagination. Since our mind is thus formed only by our power of imagination, all that is known by it is also only a product of our imagination. How can any such imaginary, relative, dualistic, and objective knowledge be considered to be true knowledge? Is it not clear, therefore, that the only true knowledge that we can attain is the clear knowledge of ourself as we really are, devoid of any superimposed adjuncts, that is, knowledge of oneself as our unadulterated and essential self consciousness I am, which is the absolute non-dual consciousness that knows only itself. All objective knowledge involves a basic distinction between the subject who is knowing and the object which is known. It also involves a third factor, the subject's act of knowing the object. Because our knowledge of ourself involves only the inherently self-conscious subject and no object, we know ourself just by being ourself, and we do so without the aid of any other thing. Because we are naturally self-conscious, we do not need to do anything in order to know ourself. Therefore, unlike all our objective knowledge, our knowledge of ourself involves neither an object nor any act of knowing, and hence it is perfectly non-dual knowledge. Objective knowledge involves an act of knowing because of the seeming separation that exists between the knowing subject and the known object. That is because the object is something that seems to be other than the subject. In order to know the object, the attention of the subject must move away from itself towards the object. This movement of our attention away from ourself towards something that seems to be other than ourself is an action or doing. Whereas we know ourself by just being ourself, we can know other things only by actively attending to them. That is only by directing our mind towards them. When we know ourself, our attention, which is our power of knowing or consciousness, rests in itself without moving anywhere. But when we know any other thing, our attention must be diverted from ourself towards that other thing. This act of directing our attention towards something that appears to be other than ourself 
is what we call thinking. Every thought involves a movement of our attention away from ourself towards some image in our mind. Our mind forms all its thoughts or mental images only by seemingly moving its attention away from itself. Since all our objective knowledge is just thoughts or mental images that our mind has formed within itself by seemingly moving its attention away from itself, it appears to exist only because of this action, which we call by various names such as thinking, knowing, cognizing, experiencing, seeing, hearing, remembering, and so on. Likewise, all the objects that we know come into existence only because of our act of knowing them. That is, since all objects are thoughts or images that arise in our mind, they are formed by our action of thinking or imagining them, an action that can occur only when we allow our attention to move seemingly away from ourself. Thus, all objective knowledge involves three basic elements, the knowing subject, its act of knowing, and the objects known by it, or in other words, the knower, the knowing, and the known. These three basic elements or factors of objective knowledge are known in Sanskrit as triputi and in Tamil as muputi, two terms which both literally mean that which is threefold, but which can be translated more comfortably by the word triad. Of these three factors of objective knowledge, the first and foremost is the knower, which is our own mind or object knowing consciousness. Without this first factor, the other two factors could not appear to exist. Therefore, our knowing mind is the root or original cause of the appearance of these three factors of objective knowledge. In other words, what these three factors depend upon for their appearance or seeming existence is the appearance of our mind. Hence, they will appear to exist only so long as our mind appears to exist. This truth is clearly stated by Sri Ramana in verse 9 of Uladu Narpadu. The pairs and the triads exist only by clinging always to one, that is, to our mind or object-knowing consciousness. If we look within our mind, what is that one? They will slip off because we will discover that their cause and supporting base, our mind, is itself non-existent. Only those who have thus seen the non-existence of our mind and the sole existence of our real self are those who have seen the reality, the absolute reality or true emness. They will not be deluded, confused, or agitated by again imagining the existence of such pairs and triads. See this absolute reality, which is our own true self, our essential non-dual consciousness of our own being, I am. In this verse, the word iratagal, or pairs, means the pairs of opposites such as life and death, existence and non-existence, consciousness and unconsciousness, happiness and unhappiness, real and unreal, knowledge and ignorance, light and darkness, good and bad, and so on. The word muputigal, or triads, means the various forms that the triad or set of three factors of objective knowledge assumes such as the knower, the knowing, and the known, the thinker, the thinking, and the thought, the perceiver, the perceiving, and the perceived, the experiencer, the experiencing, and the experienced, and so on. The unreality, both of these triads, which form the totality of our objective knowledge, and of these pairs, which are an inherent part of our objective knowledge, being objective phenomena experienced by our knowing mind, is emphasized by the word vinmai, which Sri Ramana added between the previous verse and this verse in the Kalivemba version of Uladu Narpadu. Being placed immediately before the opening words of this verse, Irataigal Muputigal. This word vinmai, which literally means skyness, that is the abstract quality or condition of the sky, which in this context implies its blueness defines the nature of these pairs and triads. That is, these basic constituents of all our objective or dualistic knowledge are unreal appearances, 
like the blueness of the sky. Just as the sky is actually just empty space, which devoid of color, so we are actually just the empty space of unadulterated self-consciousness, which is devoid of duality or otherness. Just as the seeming blueness of the sky is formed because the light of the sun is refracted when it enters the Earth's atmosphere, so the appearance of duality is formed in the undivided space of our consciousness because the clear light of our non-dual self-consciousness is seemingly divided into many thoughts or mental images when the phantom of our mind arises within us. This is why Sri Ramana says that these pairs of opposites and triads exist only by clinging always to one. The one to which they always cling is our mind, or object-knowing consciousness, and they are said to cling to it because of their seeming existence they all depend upon its seeming existence. When our mind seems to exist, as it does in waking and dream, the pairs of opposites and the triads also seem to exist. And when it does not seem to exist, as in sleep, they also do not seem to exist. Therefore, Sri Ramana says that if we look within our mind to see what that one is, the pairs of opposites and the triads will slip off. That is, if we keenly scrutinize ourselves in order to know what this object-knowing consciousness really is, we will discover that it is actually just our essential, non-dual self-consciousness, which knows nothing other than itself, and hence all the otherness and duality that it now appears to know will vanish. Our mind or object-knowing consciousness appears to exist only when we ignore our true, non-dual self-consciousness, and hence it will cease to exist when we attend only to ourself that is, to our fundamental and essential self-consciousness. When we look closely at our imaginary snake, it will disappear, and in its place only the real rope will remain. Similarly, when we look closely at this imaginary object-knowing consciousness that we call our mind, it will disappear, and in its place only our real non-dual self-consciousness will remain. Just as the snake disappears, because it is imaginary and therefore never really existed, so our mind will disappear because it is imaginary, and has therefore never really existed. And just as the sole reality underlying the imaginary appearance of the snake is the rope, so the sole reality underlying the imaginary appearance of our mind is our fundamental non-dual self-consciousness I am. When we look closely at the object-knowing consciousness that we call our mind, we will discover that it is non-existent as such, being nothing other than our real consciousness, our non-dual self-consciousness, I am, which never knows anything other than itself. When we thus discover that our object-knowing mind is non-existent as such, we will also discover that all the duality that appeared to be known by it was likewise non-existent. This is why Sri Ramana says that if we look within our mind to see what this object-knowing consciousness really is, the pairs of opposites and triads will slip off. That is, they will disappear along with their root cause, our mind. After saying that the pairs of opposites and the triads will slip off, if we see what the one object-knowing consciousness really is, Sri Ramana says, Only those who have seen thus are those who have seen the reality. Here the word kandavade, which I have translated as only those who have seen, means only those who have thus seen or experienced the non-existence of our mind and the soul existence of our real self. The word unmai, which I have translated as the reality, but which etymologically means isness or emness, here denotes the absolute reality, which is our true emness, our own essential non-dual self-conscious being. Sri Ramana then declares kalingare, which means, they will not be deluded, confused, or agitated. That is, since all delusion, confusion, and agitation arise 
only due to our knowledge of duality or otherness, which in turn arises only due to the imaginary appearance of our mind, and since our mind will disappear forever when we experience the absolute and only true existing reality, which is our own perfectly non-dual self-conscious being, after we have experienced this reality, we will never again be deluded or confused by the imaginary appearance of duality. Thus, in this verse, Sri Ramana emphasizes the fact that our mind is the one foundation upon which this entire imaginary appearance of duality is built, and that we can therefore experience the absolute reality that underlies this appearance only by scrutinizing its foundation, our mind. Until we thereby free ourselves from our self-delusive imagination that this mind is our real self, we will continue to experience the unreal knowledge of duality, and we will therefore be unable to experience the non-dual true knowledge that is our own real self. The knowledge that our mind has about the world is twofold, taking the form of knowledge about some things and ignorance about other things. Such relative knowledge and ignorance, which is one of the pairs of opposites to which Sri Ramana refers in verse 9 of Uladu Narpadu, is possible only about things other than ourself. About ourself we can never really be ignorant, because we always know ourself as I am. However, until we know ourself without the obscuring veil of superimposed adjuncts, we do not know ourselves as we really are, but know ourselves wrongly as I am such and such a person. Though this wrong knowledge that we seem to have about our true nature is sometimes called self ignorance, ignorance of our real self, or spiritual ignorance, it is not in fact real but is merely an appearance that seems to exist only in the outlook of our mind. That is, it is just a seeming ignorance that is experienced only by our mind, and not by our real consciousness, which always knows itself merely as I am. In the experience of our real consciousness I am, there is no such duality as knowledge and ignorance, because it is the sole reality underlying all appearances, and hence, nothing exists apart from or other than it for it either to know or not to know. Like all the other knowledge and ignorance that is experienced by our mind, our seeming ignorance of our true and essential nature is only relative. Moreover, even the state of self-knowledge that we now seek to attain exists only relative to our present state of self-ignorance. However, it is relative only from the standpoint of our mind, which seeks to attain it as if it were some knowledge that we do not now possess, and that we can therefore newly experience at some time in the future. This concept that our mind has about self-knowledge is a false image of what the true experience of self-knowledge really is. When we actually experience the state of true self-knowledge, we will discover that it is not something that we have newly attained at a particular point in time, but is the one and only real state which we have always experienced and will always experience because it exists eternally, beyond the relative dimensions of time, past, present, and future. That is, in that state we will clearly know that we have always been only the pure consciousness of being I am, and that ignorance, the wrong knowledge, I am this body, never really existed. Just as when we finally see the rope as it really is, we will understand that we were always seeing only that rope, and that the snake we imagined we saw never really existed. Even when we imagine that we do not know our real self, and therefore try to attend to ourself in order to know what we really are, we are in fact nothing other than our real self which always knows itself as it really is. Our seeming ignorance of the true non-dual nature of our real self is only an imagination, and the sole purpose of our effort to know ourself is only to remove this imagination. This truth is stated emphatically by Sri Ramana in verse 37 of Uladu Narpadu. Even the argument that says, Duality is real 
in the state of spiritual practice, whereas non-duality is real in the state of attainment of self-knowledge, is not true. But when we are lovingly, earnestly, or desperately searching for ourself, and when we have attained ourself, who indeed are we other than the tenth man? The word dasaman or tenth man refers to an analogy that is often used in Advaita Vedanta. According to the traditional story on which this analogy is based, ten dull-witted men once forded a fast-flowing river. After crossing the river, they decided to count how many they were in order to make sure that they had all crossed safely. Each one of them counted the other nine men, but forgot to count himself. So they all imagined that they had lost one of their companions, and instead of trying to know who that missing tenth man was, they all began to lament his loss. Seeing them weeping over the loss of their supposedly missing companion, a passerby understood that each of them had forgotten to count himself. So to convince them that none of them was really missing, he suggested that he would tap each one of them one by one, and that starting from one each man should count the next number in sequence as he was tapped. When the last man was tapped, he counted ten, whereupon they all understood that none of them was really ever missing. Who then was the tenth man, whom they had imagined they had lost? Each man who had counted the other nine men had forgotten to count himself was himself the supposedly missing tenth man. Just as the tenth man appeared to be missing only because each one of them had ignored himself and counted only the others, so we appear not to know ourself, only because we habitually ignore ourself and attend only to the things that appear to be other than ourself. Therefore, when Sri Ramana asked, Who indeed are we? other than the tenth man. What he means by the word dasaman, or the tenth man, is only our own real self, which we now imagine we do not know. Hence the meaning of the rhetorical question that Sri Ramana asks in the last sentence of this verse is that we are always truly nothing other than our own real self, both when we are searching for it and when we have discovered ourselves to be it. Just as the loss of the tenth man was merely an imagination, so our present state of self-ignorance is likewise a mere imagination. Therefore, since all the duality that we experience in this state is a result of our imaginary self-ignorance, it is also a mere imagination. Hence, even in our present state of seeming self-ignorance, the only reality is our own essential non-dual self-consciousness I am. In order for any of the ten men to discover the missing tenth man, all that was required was for him to remove his imagination that one of them was missing. And that could be achieved only by drawing his attention to himself. Similarly, in order for us to discover our own real self, all that is required is for us to remove our imagination that we know anything other than our real self, and that can be achieved only by drawing our attention towards ourself. That is, since the cause of our imaginary experience of duality or otherness is our seeming self-ignorance, it can be removed only by the experience of clear, non-dual self-knowledge which we can achieve only by attending keenly and exclusively to ourself. The necessity for spiritual practice, for our making effort to be keenly and exclusively attentive to our own self-conscious being, arises only because we imagine ourselves to be anything other than our real self, which is our essential non-dual self-consciousness. This is the meaning implied by two words that Sri Ramana added before the opening words of this verse in the Kalivemba version of Uladu Narpadu, namely, Ariyade Muyalum, which means, which we attempt or make effort to do, only due to not knowing. Being placed before the initial word of this verse, Sarakatil, which means, in the state of spiritual practice, these two words imply that we make effort to do any form of spiritual practice, including the ultimate practice of atma or self-investigation, 
only because we do not experience true self-knowledge. The true knowledge that we are just absolutely non-dual and therefore perfectly clear self-conscious being. Though this self-ignorance or lack of true self-knowledge is only imaginary, so long as we experience ourselves as being anything other than absolutely unadulterated self-consciousness, consciousness that knows nothing other than itself, its own essential beingness or emness, it is necessary for us to practice self-investigation, which is the real spiritual practice of abiding undistractedly as our own true self-conscious being.